Let's imagine two programs that both make use of some shared resource, some piece of data, for example, that both programs need to access. If one program is trying to, say, increase some value by one, there is no problem. The program can see what the value is, calculate the number one higher, and then replace the existing value. A challenge computers face, though, is how to deal with concurrency. If both programs try to access the shared data at the same time, what happens? Well, now we might have a problem. If we're unlucky, both programs will look at the original value, both will calculate the number one higher, and then both will try to replace the original value. We meant to increase the value twice, but in effect, we've only ended up with a number increased by one. This is an example of a race condition, and we'd like to avoid it if possible. To do so, we need some mechanism to ensure that only one program at a time can access some particular region of code, a region commonly called the critical section. One simple strategy is to force the programs to take turns. We can add a value to our setup that is responsible for keeping track of whose turn it is. The turn indicator starts by pointing to one program, and only that program is allowed to enter the critical section. When the program leaves the critical section, they can flip the turn indicator the other way to let it be the other program's turn. This setup does ensure that only one program is in the critical section at any given time, but it's not a great solution if, for example, one of the programs might need to access the critical section much more often than the other. If we need to access the critical section, but it's the other program's turn, then we're forced to wait, even if the other program doesn't need the critical section until later. So there must be a way to do better. Our original problem came about when both programs tried to access the critical section simultaneously, not realizing that the other wanted access too. So let's solve this problem by giving each program a way to first signal their intent to enter the critical section before they actually enter. We'll give each program a signal light that can be toggled on or toggled off. Any time a program wants to enter the critical section, they'll first turn on their signal light to indicate their intent. Then, to be safe, each program must obey this rule. A program can never enter the critical section if the other program's signal light is turned on. If the other program's signal light is turned off, then we know they don't want to enter the critical section, so we're free to enter it and access the shared data regardless of which way the turn indicator is pointing. After all, if the other program doesn't signal intent to enter, we know we can enter the critical section without conflict. After we're done, we can exit and turn off our signal light. This approach now lets a program that needs access to the critical section more frequently do so. What we need to be careful about, though, is what happens when both programs want to enter the critical section. In that case, both programs turn on their signal lights. But remember, no program is allowed to access the critical section if the other program's signal light is turned on. So both programs are now stuck in what's known as deadlock. Both programs are left waiting forever for the other program's light to turn off, but neither light ever turns off. We need some way then to resolve this deadlock. When both signal lights are on, well, that's when we can now look back to the turn indicator, to let it decide who gets to enter the section next. If ever we want to enter the critical section, but the other program's signal light is turned on, we can check to see whose turn it is. And if the turn indicator says that it's the other program's turn, then we should turn off our own signal light, then wait for it to be our turn, and only afterwards turn our own signal light back on. The other program, meanwhile, when it sees that our signal light has been turned off, can then enter the critical section, work with the shared data, and then exit. Once it exits, the program should toggle the turn indicator back to us, and then it can turn off its own signal light. 
once we see the turn indicator switch, we'll turn our own signal light back on. And since the other program signal light is turned off, we are now clear to enter the critical section ourselves. This then is Decker's algorithm for solving the mutual exclusion problem. First, we turn on our signal light. And while the other program signal light is turned on, we can't enter the critical section. So we should instead check to see if it's the other program's turn. If it is, we turn off our signal light, wait for it to become our turn, and then turn on our signal light again. Once the other program signal light turns off, we can now enter the critical section, do the work we need, and then switch the turn indicator to let it be the other program's turn, and then turn off our own signal light. It's a lot of precision for what might sound like a simple problem, but we need that precision. Without signaling, we might end up with race conditions, where two programs enter the critical section at the same time. Without keeping track of turns, we might inadvertently let one faster program have all the access to the critical section, starving the other slower program of the access that it needs. And without turning off our own light when it's the other program's turn, then we could get stuck in a deadlock. These are the kinds of challenges we need to deal with whenever thinking about concurrency. Decker's algorithm isn't the only way to solve this problem, but it was one of the first algorithms invented to do so. And it's able to work without any special hardware, just three pieces of data, two signals and one turn indicator to help make sure that two programs can share access to data without conflict.